We call narcissists energy vampires. And boy, oh boy, is that true. Anybody who has ever been in relationship with one will tell you it is the most draining experience of their life. Every vampire movie that's ever been made, part of the lure there is that that vampire cannot enter the threshold of your home unless invited in. We can think of narcissists the same way. You can learn how to repel instead of attract them. Hello, welcome to Emotional Badass, where Moxie meets Mindful. I'm your host, Nikki Eisenhower, life coach and psychotherapist. And on today's episode, I'm discussing seven mind games narcissists use to manipulate you. Narcissists, just like so many psychological diagnoses and psychological language, are just thrown around. These terms and concepts are all over the place now, cheapening their meaning, watering down what these words, these concepts, these diagnoses mean. When I speak of narcissism, I want to be clear. I have the experience, the education, the expertise to diagnose personality disorders. The average person out there does not. Don't try to diagnose narcissism when you're learning about it. You're likely here because you're recovering from narcissistic abuse, or you might be a highly sensitive person that's frightened that you have some narcissistic traits that you don't want to have. It's not really about if the person in your life fits a full criteria for a diagnosis of narcissism or not. It's more about you understanding that in this world, this world that houses many manipulative types, many users, many abusers, many low empathy, high drama, high chaos personalities. And it behooves sensitive people to learn how to stand tall, to learn how to stand strong against the forces of manipulation, to essentially learn how to emotionally stand on your own two feet, not be pushed around by the games narcissists or manipulators play. It's important for a highly sensitive person, for a trauma survivor, to learn what it is to be in self-regard, to be in self-respect and true authenticity, while we all work to reject people-pleasing tendencies that narcissistic types, manipulative types, from mild to severe, they can smell us out. We call narcissists energy vampires. And boy, oh boy, is that true. Anybody who has ever been in relationship with one will tell you it is the most draining experience of their life. We can learn how to not invite the vampires in. Every vampire movie that's ever been made, part of the lure there is that that vampire cannot enter the threshold of your home unless invited in. We can think of narcissists the same way. You can learn how to repel instead of attract them. If you, like me, were raised with manipulation and gaslighting, what that functionally means is that our human psychology, when we grow up in that, we become attracted to what we know. This is why I've had two divorces with men that were not good matches for me, but they were familiar to my childhood dynamics in ways that I didn't understand when I was younger and partnering with them. The way our psychology works is that we are attracted to what's familiar. That's not necessarily great for those of us who grew up in traumatic or neglectful environments. We're not naturally attracted to what's great for us if we come from such dynamics. And that's unfortunate. That's sad, but if we understand it, it's workable. If we don't understand it, it gets us. It sabotages a lot of our life without us even knowing it. It's why good trauma therapists discuss trauma repetition with their clients. This is a subconscious process. It's a subconscious draw or pull, an attraction toward what is familiar, but likely the very thing that hurt us if we're a survivor. Simply because it's known supported empowerment from other adults or a partnership, if it's still an unknown, it's very hard to partner with that. Now, this is not something you hear me or your therapist or a couple podcasters say once or twice and you've got it. This stuff is not like learning two plus two equals four. You know, once you know that, you'll never not know this little tidbit of two plus two equals four. Our psychology takes a different kind of learning. We benefit in accepting that we're not trying to change on the conscious level. 
two plus two equals four. I know that. I know that I don't want to partner with someone who's manipulative or low vibe. I know that. Change, growth is really about changing at the subconscious level, getting the subconscious part of your mind to accept a new, healthier pattern from the act. And it is an act. It is an action of you bringing healthiness to yourself again and again and again and again until your subconscious simply accepts what has been new for you. This is the point at which we have become healthier. It's the point where the change sticks. In this era where therapeutic language, healthy language, is so normal, it means that people with the propensity to manipulate, they know all of that language too. It's why in codependency and people-pleasing 12-step recovery, one of the strongest tools, one of the strongest ideas that can help ground us in taking care of ourselves is turn down the volume and look at the behavior. That will help you not be mystified, manipulated, confused when someone is using healthy language, but their vibe, their intention, their behavior doesn't fit congruently. If you are recovering from narcissistic abuse, it is essential that you learn to become what I call anti-manipulable. Research suggests that the world is growing more and more entitled, more low empathy people, more narcissism since the introduction of social media. Trust your gut and up your emotional intelligence by spotting and disconnecting from these seven mind games that manipulators play. I will use the words manipulation and manipulator because it's so much more valuable for you to learn to notice what happens in your body the very moment someone tries to manipulate or use you, instead of trying to figure out someone else's level of narcissism. Number one, manipulators, they love bomb at the beginning. They do this to set the stage, to have you chase the high of the beginning of the relationship. It's usually a short-lived phase, and it abruptly and confusingly ends, leaving you lost and confused. Where did that original person go? Some people spend years or a lifetime looking for that original person. This can happen in a romantic sense. Dating and love bombing, that's the traditional way that we hear about love bombing. For about those first three months, some of them can pull it off for up to six. It's all love bombing. You're the best thing ever. You're wonderful. You're perfect. You're great. Until that stops. Then there's either a nothingness or a flip-flop of messaging. You went from being at first really great, now you're horrible. Now you're pathetic. Lots of cruelty in this phase. Lots of an absence of comfort or support. Love bombing can happen even in a family, in that when you're in good graces, and in a dysfunctional family, that means obeying. That means being a good little girl or a good little boy, no matter if you're 20, 30, 40, 50, or 60. And it means that the manipulator in your life has deemed you the good girl or the good boy for the hour, the minute, or the day. And when you're in good graces, you get love, you get attention, you get support, you get family members showing up. I can make the argument that this is sort of a familial love bombing. But if you disagree, if you stand up in your adultness, if you go against family tradition, you might get ice for disagreeing, for being different. Differentation, growing up into your own separate and different person from your family of origin is typically not allowed where there's a lot of manipulation in a family system, and that is punished. The opposite of love bombing might be a love evacuation, and that is intended to punish you, to hit you in that universal human pain of feeling lonely and abandoned. And that's designed to get you to behave to their liking, to their ideals, to get you back in line, following the rules of the family system, no matter how dysfunctional, no matter how healthy, just wanting you to obey, to be similar and not different. Love bombing can happen at work too, with a boss or a company. It can be very charming. The offers at the beginning can sound amazing, but as you get into that job, you start to realize the, the glowing shininess that was presented to you. Maybe you were pitched a bunch of vacation days, and that sounds great on paper until you try to take them. Then you get shamed, controlled, manipulated. 
used. Some narcissistic bosses rage. They lose it at their staff. They'll take credit for your work and expect you to go along with that, punishing you if you confront that behavior. Highly sensitive people can learn to be more like Teflon than sponge, so that bad behavior can slide right off. It'll still take energy. Sometimes sensitive people seem to take the message that if they're really doing their work the right way, then they can be in the vicinity of an energy vampire and not have any energy loss. We can certainly get better at retaining our energy, but it's like we're holding a force field. And just like in every sci-fi movie you've ever seen that held a force field, you can't just hold a force field indefinitely because that takes energy. If you're going to hang out with an energy vampire, you are likely to have a loss of energy. Though you can manage that better in degrees. Make sure to hit that subscribe and follow button to get more videos like this in your feed. Number two, manipulators leave you hanging. Now, don't overblow what I'm saying here. We have to normalize, particularly as people pleasers, who yes, 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 and don't have enough comfort with saying no. It's normal to need to change plans. It's normal to have to pivot in life. If you lean a little flaky or you have somebody in your life that has a lot of ease kind of flaking out of plans because of anxiety, it might be just as annoying to you, might hurt your feelings, might make you feel lonely, but that's different than a narcissistic implication. Leaving you hanging, think of a tree. And if you and I, we can picture ourselves being kids or, or older because I would totally climb a tree right now. But think about if we're both in a tree. Think about if I'm the older kid and you're the younger kid and I I'm tasked with watching you and being there for you and making sure you're safe. Imagine if we're both climbing that tree. Imagine hanging from a branch. And what if I jump down safely and walk away while you're still hanging? Really think about being in that position for a moment with me so that you can understand what this manipulative game is. Because sensitive people will say, well, Nikki, you just walked away. You didn't do anything mean. You have every right to walk away. That's true in a sense. But to be left hanging is often a way to manipulate you into needing them, into wanting them, into desiring more from them. If I walk away from you hanging in a tree, what's likely to happen is you holler to me, Nikki, help, I need your help. Help, I'm still hanging, you left. So then I get to come save you when I'm the one that left you there. And that's what spiked your anxiety because you needed some assistance. And we were there as partners and I just disappeared. It's very unsettling. It's very destabilizing. We talk a lot on this show and in Healing from Trauma about grounding ourselves. We don't feel grounded if we're in a moment of hanging from the tree. And that's the very moment a manipulator will take their energies away from us. In that moment, where any typical, well-intentioned, open-hearted person is going to be there helping you climb that tree, get up or down safely, is not going to walk away without saying, hey, I'm running to the bathroom, I'll, I'll be right back, so that you're not left with that anxiety of what's going on? Why did they leave? I don't understand. This triggers anxiously attached people. And it's a good bet that most of you who listen to emotional badass likely lean anxiously attached. Highly sensitive people tend to. We can certainly have avoidant traits too. We can also be avoidantly anxiously attached, but most of us lean anxiously attached. Sad truth, but one that if you learn will help you take care of yourself, is that manipulative types love anxiously attached people. Because an anxiously attached person really struggles to trust themselves. And that just makes it so much easier to manipulate you. So it's a task and it's a little bit of permission to fake it till you make it here. Because I know that when I say, so trust yourself, I know that some of you have done work, you've had enough time on the planet 
to be further away from some dysfunctional dynamics, to have an understanding of what that means to work on trusting yourself. This was such a puzzle for me early in my career, early in my own recovery, in my youth. How the hell does somebody trust themselves? I hadn't had a lot of trust. I hadn't had trust in my parents. I did trust my grandparents with a lot, but they also died when I was still a teenager. It wasn't their fault, but it certainly dinged me in the trusting my surroundings, trusting life, trusting that people will stay and be there for me and that I would have people I could count on. It certainly dinged me in the trust department. I didn't understand what that meant. It means starting to pay attention to yourself, not in a hyper paranoid way, but in a deep resonant way. So when your gut, your belly goes, something is weird here. Instead of just thinking that thought and sort of brushing it away, oh, so weird. It's about sitting with yourself going, wait a minute, what is weird about this? Because this is my body trying to tell me something. Think about Gusto, the mascot of the show, our standard poodle, big old 80 pound dog. Now, if we're walking on a trail and he starts showing me some body language where he's a little spooked, I'm definitely paying attention to that. Is that a mountain lion? Is that a bear? Is that a moose? Is that just another person coming on the trail? I don't want to dismiss his intuitions, his senses. It's amazing how much a highly sensitive person will get to adulthood thinking the right thing to do is to almost constantly dismiss their own gut, their own sensory experience. It's your task to work on to trust yourself. If you don't, it is so easy for a manipulator to come take your self-trust and try to get you to trust them while they play games. That is a way to feel disembodied, to feel constantly confused, to feel dissociative, and to frankly feel every bit of crazy when you are most certainly not. You're just being toyed with into and towards losing your grip on yourself. Because if you don't have a grip on yourself, you'll grip the manipulator just to grip something. If you're interested in self-trust as a topic, the Patreon episode this month that's exclusive, that's nowhere else, is about trusting yourself. Now, it's a process, and it's one to not put off. You don't need to get to any kind of place in your life You don't have to get to some kind of place financially. You don't have to get to some kind of relationship place. This is something to start right now if you haven't already. Your inner child deserves to feel a sense of safety and trust from grown-up adult you. And you don't have to do this perfectly. Perfectionism is a real sneaky bee. Y'all, we recently got the explicit distinction off of the show. I'm trying to keep the show really clean. If you want me speaking with a little more freedom, That's what the Patreon's for. When your inner child trusts that you will not leave him or her hanging, will not give your personal authority to a manipulator, you will feel a sense of self-support like maybe you've never felt before. This is what builds self-worth. That's why it's not other worth. It's not othered esteem. It's self-esteem. You will feel a sense of enoughness in your worth as a person. That's the benefit of this work. Even if part of you is like, I don't get it. I don't really get what that work is. That's okay. Start with the permission. You deserve to feel enoughness. You deserve to feel self-support. That is exactly right. When you grow your worth in these ways, this will help you not let a manipulator poke you in an abandonment wound. It will help you not have... The scabs you have formed from your brave healing, it will help you not allow a manipulator to get psychologically close enough to you to rip those scabs off. This is an ongoing conversation with my inner child. Doesn't mean I tell her every day, but whenever the idea, the inclination crosses my path, I very often tell my inner child, oh, sweet girl. Sweet girl, I want you to know that I will be with you always. I'm so sorry you didn't have adult me when you were little. 
but you will have me always, every single moment of our lives. You are my priority, and I'm in charge. I promise to take loving care of you and us. And when I make a mistake, I will do my best to make it right and to continue to learn, to make this life just as easy as it can possibly be for us, even within all that's hard. This is what teaches a body and a mind to feel a deep sense of trust with the self and with life. It's not about having enough people around you that are trustworthy. In fact, from the self-trust is how you actually learn what it is to trust. And it will help you align with other trustworthy people. It doesn't happen so well the other way around with you not trusting yourself, but desperately trying to find trustworthy people. Remember congruence? When I am in self-respect, my inner child can trust me. When I am in self-respect, I cannot and will not allow anyone to get in my head and control me with manipulation. Number three, manipulators resist conversations about the relationship, about defining it or redefining it or getting it healthy. They tend to resist discussing its terms, its boundaries. If it's parent and child, the resistance is in meeting that child as an actual adult and wanting to treat them as a perpetual child all the days of their lives, just so that the manipulative parent stays in the power position. It's too vulnerable to not be in that power position and to build a more equal, respecting adult relationship with an adult child, which is what happens over time in healthier family dynamics. When a manipulator won't discuss the terms of a relationship, the bounds of it, this goes for a boss too. Bosses that are calling you at 11 o'clock at night, they don't want you mentioning boundaries. They're pushing yours. This feels unsettling. It feels unsafe. It feels confusing. It feels one-sided. Feels like a power differential because it, it is. And you finding your power is important. Confusion is a big, big part for a highly sensitive person that is being manipulated. Confusion is one of the main dishes served in the house of narcissism, y'all. Highly sensitive people spend so much time and energy being confused. In fact, psychologically, they prefer confusion. When I look back at both of my dysfunctional marriages before I married Chris, I spent so much time and energy being confused. Because the truth was, if I stopped being confused, I had to make a change. I had to deal with what actually was. And I can see now, in ways that I couldn't back then, that I kept choosing it. It certainly didn't feel like a choice. But I kept choosing confusion. I'm confused. He's going to therapy with me, but he doesn't seem to be getting anything out of it. None of what we talk about in the therapy appointments seems to happen in our lives. What is going on? This is so confusing. It's not really. And I've had this conversation with thousands of people now in my career. I look people in the eye and I say, but you're not confused. You know. Tell me what you know. In those moments, I can see the mental wheels turning. And when someone finally says aloud, this isn't working. Something's wrong here. Then we deal with reality and we make changes. It's very important for highly sensitive people to understand their relationship with confusion. If you had a parent that had bad behavior, and I know that's very general, I mean that generally right now, what's likely is that whenever that bad behavior, whatever flavor of bad behavior that was, was happening when you were little, you couldn't do anything about it except have a bunch of confusing thoughts because it's very confusing for a small child to have a parent that's dysregulated. So I had to admit to myself that I had such a familiarity with confusion that I was going into confusion instead of going into self-respect and trusting that if I am that confused, something's wrong. Number four, game manipulators play. They make promises and don't have the empathy to empathize 
when you're very reasonably upset, that you're disappointed, or if you express, hey, it's important to me that I can count on you and that you say what you mean and mean what you say, there's no, man, you're right, I'm sorry. I did say that, I did commit to that, and I didn't take your feelings into consideration, or I'm so sorry I had to cancel. Let me get this on my calendar again so that we can do this. I want to follow through for you and for me. One of the hardest episodes that I ever put out was me talking about my biological father and the evolution of his eventual abandonment of me and how often I would spend hours and hours and hours, sometimes all day, out on my grandmother's porch, every car that I heard turning on the street going, he's coming, that's him, only to be disappointed again. He didn't possess the empathy or the maturity to be connected to what it does to a child, to have a father promise, I miss you, I love you, I'm coming to see you. And then just not because there's football on TV or maybe he had a date the night before, just felt like sleeping in. It is very difficult for high empathy people to understand low empathy. What happens to highly sensitive people is it's like they can't accept that another human being has low empathy because when you have high empathy, it affects every moment of your life, almost every decision you make, everything that you see on TV or in a movie, every interaction you have. Even if you're in a bad, funky mood, empathy and compassion is a part of how you breathe. It's a part of how you move through the world. The idea that other people could be out there operating without that, everything that compassion and empathy is, is like believing somebody can breathe without lungs. It's strange. It's a weird conceptualization and consideration for people that are wired very, very differently. Maybe it's like asking a monkey to understand being a fish. And it would be really, really confusing if a fish looked just like a monkey sometimes. Sensitive people do what regular old humans do. It's normal and typical in the human psychology to project our way of being on other people. We don't typically know that we're doing this. So high empathy people tend to walk the world projecting their high empathy onto other people. And then they're very puzzled when they get low empathy responses back. Trust the difference between someone going through struggle, needing to change plans because of life in a way that is respectful and kind and considerate, as considerate as can be, versus changing plans in a way that is very dismissive of your humanity, your feelings, your time, your space. Trust if you feel a vibe that someone's trying to punish you or teach you that you don't matter. Trust if you feel a sense that someone is not valuing your feelings your desires, your needs, and be mindful about not swinging to the other side in a dysfunctional way. Our friends, good, solid, compassionate people with maturity, they're not supposed to pay attention to every little squeak from us. Over sensitivity, kind of like overthinking is exhausting, but we want a reasonable amount of considerate sensitivity between people. Consideration. This leads me to number five, people who manipulate a lot. They tend to not take personal responsibility in any real way. They're experts at deflecting, dumping, blaming, and shaming, but not ever taking responsibility. Their apologies are empty. You might eke out an I'm sorry out of somebody, but an honest I'm sorry also brings with it a commitment to do work to not create the same situation again. For manipulators, I'm sorry has a different definition. For a manipulator, I'm sorry means, these are the words I say, I'm sorry, to make this moment where I'm in the hot seat, stop. This is what gets me out of this in this moment till I do it again. That's the definition of I'm sorry to someone on the narcissistic spectrum or people who are deep into manipulation. Survivors often tell me that they feel like they'd make excellent lawyers because they have so much experience trying to build airtight cases to prove that whatever they want in their relationship, whatever they're working towards, it matters. 
It makes sense. It's a good thing. And so they build cases like lawyers in relationships with manipulators. And all I'm going to say here is that if this is you, if you're recognizing, "Uh uh-oh, I do some of these manipulative things, I want you to take a deep breath. Lots of highly sensitive people have a deep-seated fear that they are narcissistic. Full-blown narcissism lacks insight and personal responsibility. Lean into personal responsibility. Lean into ownership. You need the kind of therapist who can be a bit tough with you and not let you get away with anything and you've got to be radically honest with that person. If you can do that, it means you have insight and it means you have maturity and you're growing that maturity and you can change this for you and anyone who loves you now and anyone who will come into your life and care about you in the future. I have lived years, some of the most painful years of my life in this kind of needing to be a lawyer mode. What does it say about any relationship if one person feels like they must be a super lawyer to manage the relationship, to want or need things in life? You have to put together a whole court case. In healthy relationships, we discuss, even when there's upset or someone lashes out or has bad behavior or slips into an old maladaptive pattern, in a healthy relationship, We still don't need to lawyer up or become a lawyer. We can just be a humbled person with another humbled partner. We move towards solutions and we let go of the rest. No courthouse or court proceedings or lawyering needed. Number six, manipulators, they try to get you to chase them down, not returning calls or texts, won't nail down plans or follow through. Then they get annoyed, angry, even disgusted with you for your efforts and label you needy. And this is a bit like leaving you hanging, but I'm giving you a little more nuance with that dynamic. It's about wanting you to chase them. Think about that. If someone really struggles with narcissism, which is the godlike complex in the human condition, gods don't chase you down. Think about the arrogance there, the entitlement. If I'm a narcissist, that's on you. You better chase me down. So this is a game that gets created that fuels their ego, that fuels their arrogance. I am the God. You shall come to me. Not that that's a thought. Maybe it is, but not necessarily in someone who has arrogance and manipulation. If you're anxiously attached, it means that you will benefit from a little bit more soothing, a communicative partner. Some of this is just negotiating styles amongst healthy people. When I met Chris, he had been a bachelor living on his own all of his life in his mid-30s. So things like him coming and going in the house, he never had to tell anybody that. So there were some times in our early relationship living together where I would just think he was in the house and he wasn't. And it was just confusing for him. He's like, oh, you would want to know if I'm leaving? Yeah. He hadn't just thought about that. But because he doesn't think about it of his own accord, he would forget to tell me he's on his way home or that he's going to leave. We've worked on that individually and together. Now, I don't need that so much because I trust him. And if I walk around the house and he's gone and he's not here, I don't get triggered in any way because I've grown a trust in him and I've grown a trust in me. See, early on, My inner psychology went, "Uh uh-oh, is this some kind of game to leave you hanging because it's part of my experience coming from manipulation? It was on me and my healing to not lump my healthy husband into that category of manipulator. But my body had to learn his safety over time. My body had to learn that I had healed my people picker And could trust who I had picked this time. And that took some time. Because I hadn't picked so well for myself before. And that's okay. That's healthy. It's how it works when two well-intentioned, willing human beings get together. We're going to work our kinks out individually and together. That's truly what happens in a good, healthy, grounded relationship. Anxiously attached people. It's a balance. If you're with someone who is finding some kind of subconscious delight in triggering your anxious attachment, that's not going to work for you. 
that keeps a nervous system in a state of anxious attachment. Now, it's tricky and it's nuanced. We need securely attached people and people working on their anxious attachment to help us with our security. We can become more securely attached within ourselves. It's part of why I do work talking to the inner child. It increases our feelings of attachment to ourselves, which helps us not desperately attach to a dysfunctional human being that's not going to be great for our system, our mind, our body, our growth, our development, our peace. Sometimes avoidant types are misdiagnosed or misperceived as narcissists when they're not, because as the experiencer, if someone just kind of ghosts you, if someone leaves, that may be because they just don't know what to do. They may feel a lot of guilt. They may feel ashamed. They may not know how to do any better than what they're doing. And that may be what y'all work on together in a way that might be hard sometimes, but reasonable for both people with proper personal responsibility, ownership, and willingness to truly grow, not just saying the words, but true willingness, that can be worked on. But if an avoidant person gets their jollies, learns that their partner is anxiously attached and continues the behavior with low empathy, low consideration, low commitment to negotiating what can work for both people, then there might be some narcissism there somewhere on the spectrum. If someone continues to weaponize pulling attention away from you with the intention of hurting or destabilizing and then blaming you when you feel anxious or when you say, hey, we talked about this. I thought this wasn't going to happen anymore and it happened again. And you have a gaslighting instead of a personal ownership experience, then that may be an avoidant person who also has low empathy. If you lean avoidant as a highly sensitive person or a survivor, up your communication. Notice the parts of you that don't want to, that want the control of not sharing that. It's a vulnerability that you face leaning into. If you don't want to grow more avoidance and you deserve vulnerability, you sweet avoidant people out there, you deserve it within yourself and you deserve it with someone else if you want relationship, if you want partnership. I'm of the belief that most people benefit from partnership when it's a healthy partnership. I think we are made as human beings for partnership. There are certainly people who are absolutely, totally healthy being singular, but I don't want any one of you to think that you are too broken to have relationship. No one is too broken for relationship. We can lean into healthy relationship when we have personal responsibility. Let me say that better. Anyone who brings a willingness and a personal responsibility to a personal relationship with yourself or a relationship with other people can grow. But if people don't have the insight, they don't have the commitment, they don't have the dedication and the personal responsibility and ownership, then they're not willing. If I've had an argument with my husband, I tend to want some space. He tends to not need space. When we first partnered up, this would sometimes trigger him. Now, he's worked on understanding and helping his inner child know that when I take a little bit of time, I'm taking care of myself. I'm coming back to myself and I'm coming back to him to repair, to connect just as soon as I'm in the right space and energy to do so. I've worked on communicating with great clarity that I'm not disappearing, I'm not running away, I'm not going into isolation to plan my exit or divorce from the relationship. I'm just taking care of myself and my vibes. This is now a very easy total non-issue between us because we've both come to this work honestly and with lots of personal responsibility. I tried very hard to do very similar work with other men in my history. What I didn't understand was that they weren't meeting me in that work, not honestly and not deeply. And that was never going to work for me. If you are with someone who seems committed to not owning their side of the street, just be real with yourself. If you're an overthinking, overfunctioning enabler type, be very, 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 very real with yourself here. And if you need to get some outside perspective, support, advice, knowledge, help about the true workability of your relationship, please go seek that out. Number seven, the final manipulative game that I'm going to share today. This is not an exclusive list. The final one I'm sharing is 
Manipulators throw temper tantrums like a toddler. Very few people get to witness the temper tantrum that a manipulative person will throw. The people who tend to see this are their primary victim, the partner, the parents, the children. If it's a boss, it's going to be the employees, often the employees that are paid the best because they're not just paid for their job, they're paid to endure this type of abuse. Those are the hard questions we have to ask sometimes. Is this paycheck worth it? Is this job title worth it? Is it ever really worth it to endure abuse? And we each have a different system, a different experience, a different psychology. We each have to evaluate the messiness of this human experience and condition. Very few situations are perfect. Humans are messy people. Humans may lash out at each other. Humans will show each other their bad behavior. We all are tasked with figuring out enoughness, the amounts that are reasonable to tolerate, the amounts that are unreasonable to tolerate. The tantrum, when we see an adult tantrum, and I do have an episode where I encourage you to tantrum. The nuance there is it's okay to get stuff out of your body. If you weren't allowed to tantrum as a little girl or a little boy, you might have to let that buildup of energy out of your body. The difference is in that being an experience that helps you release versus throwing your temper tantrum energy at another person to upset them, to hurt them, it's a pretty big difference. Now, it's true that people who manipulate, they tend to feel really insecure. The arrogance of narcissism is a real cover-up mask. Now, there's no true narcissist on the planet that's going to admit to me that they feel super empty on the inside, that they feel very insecure. It's why they work so hard to present as the most secure, most together person so often. And you might have, I certainly have, proper empathy here for narcissists, for manipulators, for game players, because it's not a great life to damage your relationships with gameplay. It's not a great life to move through the preciousness of this one life that we each get and primarily play games just because we didn't know how to feel safe enough to live without those games. This truth of narcissism is very, very sad. It's often why the currency between narcissists and people, narcissists and family members, is money and gifts. This is so that vulnerability is not the currency. It's also a way to control. A toddler is a lovely human who, age appropriately, is selfish. And I know we don't think of toddlers this way because they're so sweet and they're so cute. But psychologically, I'm going to make the argument that small children, they're kind of low empathy for their parents because they haven't developed it yet. If they're upset, they don't care how tired mama is. Don't even have a concept of it. If they scream for 48 hours and that mom is so raw, that dad is so raw, that child doesn't have the development yet to consider another, to go, oh, geez, maybe I should take a deep breath because mom seems really worn out. That child is biologically programmed to be developmentally selfish. This is how small children survived. They would just scream and scream and scream till someone tended to them. That's a survival mechanism. In healthy development, we grow up and out of that kind of self-preservation selfishness that makes us arrogant or superior to others. It's okay, it's even healthy to have empathy for the struggle in a low maturity person. It's okay to have compassion for whatever trauma created a low maturity, high game playing, manipulative human being. The problem with recovering people pleasers is that they tend to give the entirety of their empathy and compassion away. We maintain a balance here. It's important to own that it's your job to not give away all of your compassion, all of your empathy, and all of your understanding outwardly. You are part. You are someone who gets to have that compassion and empathy from yourself. Retain some of it for you. You are the part of the relationship equation that you have the power to change and evolve. You really don't have any power to change or evolve another person. Hold your empathy for yourself here as an act of self-care and self-love. I hope today's episode really helps you see manipulation for what it is, to feel it in your gut, to feel that resonance, that 
coherence, that, that alignment with truth or not, and to trust what you're sensing. And if you get it wrong in the journey, that's okay. That's how we learn. You'll, you'll get it more right next time. Remember, you're not just learning consciously. Two plus two equals four. You're reprogramming at a subconscious level. Healing is like learning a new language. I happen to be learning Italian right now. I'm using Duolingo. We've gotten some children's books that we know well that are in Italian. We're listening to Italian rap. We are searching out favorite movies that we know well that we can watch in Italian, I am immersing myself so that I can absorb the new language that feels so foreign to me right now. If you want to speed up your healing, it's about immersing yourself, even in the things you don't quite understand yet, like me in Italian, trusting that there will be a moment when it connects, where it clicks, where your subconscious understands, oh, this is what we do now? This is how we speak? This is how we hold space for ourselves? This is what self-respect is? Yes, subconscious, yes. And it's in those moments that we get to feel that all of our hard work was worth it. And the truth is we don't feel that a second before. So don't give up, stick with it. If you want more, come join the Patreon at patreon.com slash emotional badass. This audience, I'm very grateful now and always Y'all have been our marketing team and you have spread this show all over the world. We still get messages with people saying the show is life-saving and life-changing. If you know someone who would like this episode, please share it. If you're on our social media, like, subscribe, make a comment, work those algorithms for us because we can't by ourselves. Even if it's just a heart, just a thumbs up. We have something new and exciting coming up, and I'm so excited to announce it to you. We are so close. Stay tuned because maybe you will be a part of what we're doing next. Emotional Badass is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. I am an emotional badass. You are an emotional badass. And together, we are where moxie meets mindful, where we are no longer manipulable, Light and love, and I will see you right here next time for a brand new episode. Bye-bye. Patreon.com slash emotional badass. This audience, I'm very grateful. Now and always, y'all have been our marketing team and you have spread this show all over the world. We still get messages with people saying the show is life-saving and life-changing. If you know someone who would like this episode, please share it. If you're on our social media, like, subscribe, Make a comment, work those algorithms for us because we can't by ourselves. Even if it's just a heart, just a thumbs up. We have something new and exciting coming up and I'm so excited to announce it to you. We are so close. Stay tuned because maybe you will be a part of what we're doing next. Emotional Badass is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. Remember to find Emotional Badass wherever you get your podcasts. I am an emotional badass. You are an emotional badass, and together we are where moxie meets mindful, where we are no longer manipulable. Light and love, and I will see you right here next time for a brand new episode. Bye-bye. Mm-hmm.